Over the last decade, the federal government has launched a full-blown attack on the civil liberties of U.S. citizens, all in the name of protecting us from the manufactured threat of terrorism. Along with the rise of the expanding surveillance state, there's a coinciding crackdown on whistleblowers exposing government wrongdoing. This climate of censorship has given rise to a new form of dissent, hacktivism. No group exemplifies this more than the online collective, simply known as Anonymous. By now, you've surely heard of activists like Julian Assange or Aaron Swartz. But how much you know about Barrett Brown? He's a 31-year-old writer who was arrested last September and later indicted on a dozen different federal charges for disseminating information associated with the Stratford Intel WikiLeaks release. So what threat does Brown really pose to the government to merit a potential sentence of over 100 years in federal prison? And should distributing damning information from the clutches of shady corporations be a crime at all? To discuss this and more, I'm joined now by Christian Stork of who? What, why? org from our New York studio. Thanks so much for coming on, Christian. Thank you for having me. So talk about the charges brought against Barrett Brown. Why is he facing more than a lifetime in prison? Well, Barrett Brown was indicted three separate times, uh, and as you mentioned in your lead-up, one of those times was for copying and pasting a chat room link, or a link between chat rooms from an anonymous uh, internet relay chat to a Project PM relay chat, Project PM being uh, Barrett Brown's initiative that he had interest in. So he was first raided by the FBI on March 6, 2012. Uh, in looking for information related to the hack of Stratfor, a private intelligence firm with significant ties to the American intelligence community, and uh, it's also in relation to the entities his uh, research effort was uh, looking into. Uh, they couldn't find anything, and he sought refuge at his mother's with a laptop. Uh, they then came to the mother's asking for the laptop. Uh, he didn't give it. They returned with a ser search warrant and were able to obtain it, but still couldn't find any sort of uh, any criminal link between him and the hack itself. Uh, nevertheless, they threatened to charge his mother with obstruction of justice, which begot a uh, poorly worded confession of sorts by Barrett online in a YouTube video in which he vaguely threatens uh, an FBI agent, uh, Special Agent Robert Smith. He vaguely threatens him. Uh, and the FBI took that as a pretext to then arrest him on the spot. This was September 12, 2012. Uh, they took him into custody that night. They held him without charge and without bail for a number of weeks uh, until early October when they unveiled an indictment on him uh, in relation to harassment and threatening a, a federal officer. Then in uh, December, I think, believe it was December 4, 2012, they unveiled a second indictment against Barrett Brown that was the link uh, copying which I just explained and which you referred to and then on January 23rd of this year they unveiled the finally the third indictment which is the obstruction of justice charges although not against his mother they are now being laid against him for that initial March raid. Um, they usually go for the jugular I'm not surprised that they went after his mom and kind of provoked him into uh, getting this confession quote unquote um, you know, according to Think Progress, aiding terrorists to build a nuclear weapon lands you 20 years in prison. <laughs> what bigger threat could Brown be than helping terrorists build a nuke? I mean, it's just amazing. And, you know, he was charged with trafficking stolen material across state lines. This is what you're talking about, this one indictment of him simply posting a link. How much of a slippery slope is this specific indictment? Should I stop posting links? I mean, he's simply posting a link of some of a hack. Break that specific charge down for me. Well, that specific charge is actually uh, the most interesting one, I believe. He, uh, as I mentioned, he copied and pasted a link from an anonymous IRC. It's basically your uh, any normal chat room that your viewers can imagine uh, into a Project PM IRC. Now the link he copied itself wasn't a generalized link to the overall cache of documents. Uh, it was more precise than that, although in, its, in itself it contained massive amounts of data and so I refer to it it's as a sort of a sub cache uh, of documents and in that data were a number of uh, credit with the credit card information of a number of clients and subscribers to 
uh, Stratfor's emailing list and uh, other people who had given them their billing data. Now that is the uh, essential transgression that the government is claiming, is that he gave this data, I mean he essentially gave it to himself, he was more or less copying and pasting it so his researchers could go through it and then assess the data in there. And, and he's actually gone on record in uh, written statements uh, after, his, after Project PM became, it started uh, saying that he didn't find the use of credit card information of Stratfor clients to be a, a noble endeavor or a worthy one. Initially, when the hack occurred, Anonymous had advocated that people pilfer this uh, billing data and then make uh, donations to uh, charities of their choice. It, it turns out in actuality that would be much less fe feasible considering people would simply call their credit card companies, cancel the transaction, and mm. eventually the uh, the charities might end up receiving uh, bad press about it. So uh, Barrett Brown was explicitly against such tactics and had only posted that link in terms of trying to uh, make it a research subject for Project PM. And talk briefly about Project PM. What was he able to reveal through this project? Sure, so Project PM is a crowd-resourced uh, distributed think tank. It's essentially a wiki where readers can be editors. And although it started in 2009, it really gains its own purpose after the hack of a cybersecurity firm known as HB Gary. In February of 2011, HB Gary, uh, their HB Gary Federal CEO, Aaron Barr, at the time, he was quoted in a Financial Times pieces as outing the uh, top three members of Anonymous. Uh, Anonymous in retaliation hacked his servers, obtained all sorts of emails, 75,000 plus emails from his account, and that was the Project PM research effort was going through those emails. Now in those emails were a number of extremely shady deals, uh, or excuse me, potential deals. They were pitches between these cybersecurity firms and the uh, law firm and lobbying firm Hunton and Williams. Uh, and Hunton and Williams was soliciting uh, pitches in efforts to destroy uh, WikiLeaks in terms on behalf of one client, that client being Bank of America. They were worried that WikiLeaks was sitting on a cache of documents from Bank of America. And also in another case of trying to attack uh, critics of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber is also a uh, client of Hunton and Williams. So uh, those were potentially uh, illegal. There were certainly nefarious deeds being uh, at least thought out, at least in their initial conspiracy stage, among the cybersecurity firms and uh, a cutout for what were essentially their clients were being uh, Bank of America and the Chamber of Commerce. Well, definitely, uh, he's just the latest in a long line of people being attacked. Um, Obama saying he doesn't want to look backward to prosecute Bush criminals, but he's certainly looking backward to dredge up archaic pieces of legislation to prosecute whistleblowers. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll definitely be paying attention to this case. Um, Christian Stork, who, what, why, dot org.